today we'll be covering general understanding of sensory processing systems and sensory integration, just to give everyone background information, as well as the role of sensory processing in development and some different red flags to look for. And then I'll be covering some different sensory integration principles and what we do in therapy. Okay. So when I have families come in, they often ask me, what is sensory? What does that all mean? So I like to break it down, give you guys a definition. So sensory processing is the body and brain's ability to receive and organize information gathered from our environment through its senses for functional use. So let's break that down a little bit further to understand it. So the what is able, being able to take info from our body and the environment, and we organize it and use it for functional purposes in our everyday life. The where, it occurs in our central nervous system, and if everything's going as, should it, as it should be, it's a well-balanced and reciprocal process. Why is sensory integration important? It really helps us survive, make sense of the world, interact with our environment in meaningful ways, and interact with others. So how? Sensory integration happens automatically, as we take in senses through sensory receptors in our skin, our ear, muscles, eyes, ear, mouth, nose, etc. The when. Sensory integration actually begins in utero and then continues to develop throughout childhood and usually by adolescence most functions are established. Work with sensory processing is based on principles developed by Jean Ayers. Um, back in the day, back in the 60s, 70s, she was doing a lot of her work, and she has two main principles of sensory integration theory. One, that it's an innate process. It's neurobiological. It's natural. So that involves integration, interpretation of sensory stimuli from the environment by the brain. And then also it's child-driven, which you'll see in sensory treatment. Sensory integration is driven by the child's drive to master their environment and interact with others. Okay, so I will be going over different senses as well as some different red flags that we see. Okay, our first one being proprioception. So that's our muscle and joint awareness. So we take in information from our joints and muscles and that gives us an internal body map and we know how our body parts relate to one another. It tells us where our body is in space along with vision and movement. So if you were to close your eyes right now, you would know exactly how you're sitting, if your legs are crossed, if you're leaning on a table. That sense of proprioception gives you that sense. Proprioception also helps us grade our body movements, so it gives our brain feedback on how hard of a force to use when doing something. So for example, if you're throwing a ball at a target, you might throw harder from one distance versus another distance. Or if you're writing your name on a sheet of paper, you know how hard to push down with your pencil. So red flags. As I go through the presentation, I'm going to be talking about kids that are over-responsive in an area. So think of that as they're being overly sensitive. You have kids that are under-responsive and those are kids that have poor registration of that sense. And then we also have our sensory seekers as well. A lot of people will ask me, is it typical for my child to be a combination in different areas? They're you know, overly sensitive to touch, but they're seeking out a different type of input. And the answer is yes, they can be a mix. So with that being said, we'll talk about proprioception. Kids who are over-responsive or overly sensitive in this area avoid strong input. So they're going to avoid weight-bearing activities that provide really strong input, like jumping, crawling, running. Think back to when your kids were really little, that first year of life, when they're doing tummy time, they're learning how to crawl. All those experiences early on are really crucial to help with strengthening, but also it gives them that muscle and joint awareness. So if they're avoiding tummy time, crawling, the kids that skip crawling, um, those are can be some red flags sensory-wise. Kids who are over-responsive, as a result, tend to be less coordinated. Um, so motor planning can be affected. So we'll be talking about that a little later on. 
Kids who are under-responsive, on the other hand, have really poor registration or poor body awareness. So they, too, will also be clumsy. Um, they often have difficulty maintaining an upright posture. So with proprioception, you get that sense from receptors that are in your muscles and joints. So in a nutshell, those receptors from your muscles and joints aren't giving your body that information to get in that proper body position to have um, good posture. Um, kids in this area, too, another red flag, because they have that poor body awareness, ADLs are going to be affected. So being able to orient their body to get dressed in the morning. Um, these kids also, like I mentioned before, grading strength is an issue. So they might use too little pressure or too much pressure. So sometimes I'll have kids, especially in preschools, where they have poor body awareness and they tend to be too rough in their play and they don't realize it. Um, so that's something I'll see in that area. These kids, too, also will have lower muscle tone, so you're going to see that again with that ability to maintain an upright posture. Now, our sensory seekers, a lot of people can probably relate to these kids, so they are craving any kind of input that they can, both active movement by bumping and crashing, whether it's into people, objects, walls, off the furniture, um, but also passive input, too. These kids might like to be tightly swaddled. They might like those tighter clothes. Um, in some cases, I have kids that actually will self-stim for input by headbanging to get input. So as an OT, my job is to figure out, especially with the sensory seekers, what type of sensory activities are going to help to replace that sort of behavior or that need that satisfies their bodies. All right. So the next slide here just has some pictures of activities that incorpor incorporate that proprioceptive input. So giving input into muscles and joints, and these are some pictures from one of our outpatient centers. So the first one on the far left, um, I have a boy on the net swing on his belly, and then I'm holding a rope ladder in that picture. So with that, he's really engaging his muscles because as you can see, he has to pull himself all the way to the top of that rope ladder. So it's giving a lot of strong input into his muscles and joints. And then it's actually combined with some movement input. When he, when he gets to the top, he gets a toy, and then he gets to swing down. The girl in the middle is on a scooter board on her belly, and she's getting puzzle pieces, I believe. And with that, she has to do a lot of weight-bearing. So weight-bearing activities are great to get that proprioceptive input. Um, she's using just her arms and her hands to pull herself along the gym to get her puzzle pieces. She's not using her feet. So you'll get a lot of strong input with that. And then lastly, on the far right, you guys are probably wondering what that is. And it's actually a fabric tunnel. So it's made out of a t-shirt material. It's totally homemade. And the boy that's in the tunnel at that time is pushing a smaller therapy ball through that. So with that fabric tunnel, it stretches out to the size of your body, so you're getting some deep pressure input, you're getting the weight bearing, so that will give you input into the muscles and joints, and it's a little bit more resistive pushing a ball through. I'll also have kids push smaller weighted medicine balls through that as well. So those are just some examples, but there are many other activities and possibilities. Next I'll be covering vestibular sense. Um, and that's considered movement processing. So I'm going to give just a quick little anatomy reference, but I'm not going to go too detailed in that. Um, but as some of you may know, our sense of movement is actually processed in our ear, and that's through one of our cranial nerves. And then there's part of your ear anatomy. You have parts of it that detects head rotary movement, so that would be like you're spinning, so more of a circular movement. And then the other part of it detects linear movement. So that's your back and forth type movement. So just a little tidbit of information with that. Um, our vestibular sense lets us know, along with vision, if our bodies are moving, if the earth's moving. Um, it also tells us the position of our head in space. And it also helps to generate muscle tone. Okay. 
to some different red flags in regards to movement processing. Kids who are over-responsive, their vestibular system is on overload all the time. So these are kids that are cautious, they're slow moving, they're not going to like to do movement activities, especially on the playground. And there's two types of over-responsiveness that we're going to see. Um, one is just a general intolerance to movement. So again, they're less likely to take risks in play, play on the playground, go on swings. Um, I've also seen some kids that have what we call gravitational insecurity. So they're very fearful of their feet being off the ground. One example that I always give when I give this presentation, there was a four or five year old girl that I was working with on the autism spectrum and she had sensory needs my first time seeing her and I thought, ah, I'll put her on one of the swings, she'll love it. However, I put her on the, tried to put her on the swing and she literally clung to my body. Um, luckily with our swing hookups, we can adjust the height so I made it closer to the ground where her feet could touch. And she was still fearful, but she would do it. And over time, I was able to raise that swing and she was not fearful anymore of having her feet off the ground. She had the same kind of reaction when I put her on an exercise ball to do some bouncing. If the feet were off the ground, that primal fear really kicked in. Um, I've even seen some kids where they have a reaction from walking from one surface to the other. So if they're walking in the house from carpet to, you know, tile or linoleum, they don't detect that's a flat surface. To them, they sense it as a drop, and then they limit where they're going to walk and where they're going to explore. Um, for kids that are under-responsive, however, they have a poor registration of movement. So they're not responding negatively, but they don't really seem to notice or register that movement input. Um, we'll put kids on the swing and they want to spin, 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 or roll in that barrel. And for me, just watching them, I get dizzy, but they don't get dizzy at all. They actually need more of that movement input in order to register it and make their bodies feel good. Um, Another thing that we'll see sometimes is that this will impact kids' protective reactions. So think of when you lose your footing and you fall. You automatically put your arm out, you outstretch it that way, you don't fall and hurt yourself. Um, these kids might have delayed reactions in that area because they have that poor body awareness, they're not registering that they're falling right away, so they're more likely um, to fall and get hurt. Kids that are sensory seeking, we can all relate to these kids. They're thrill seekers, so they're craving more intense movement. They're the ones that say, push me higher, go faster. Um, when they're in school, they really have a lot of trouble sitting still. They're always moving, so they're always craving that movement input in order to self-regulate. Um, as I mentioned before, difficulties in processing this movement information can result in that lower muscle tone. So they're going to fatigue at the table. Their posture is going to be less than ideal, so you're going to see them leaning and moving around a lot. Um, their balance can be compromised as well. Um, so those are some different movement red flags for you guys. So the next slide has some pictures of some movement activities that we do in the outpatient center. The first one on the far left um, I have a girl on her belly on one of the swings throwing bean bags. Um, in the middle, there's a boy in a barrel, so we can have them crawl through it, but we'll also have kids roll. I've done some human bowling <laughs> using the barrel. Um, and then on the far right is the air walker swing, which is actually intended to have kids stand up in it, but a lot of our kids like to go inside and curl up. It's made out of this stretchy spandex-like material, so it gives some deep pressure as they're doing the movement. Um, again, these are just some examples. There are a ton of other things that we do, and we use these pieces of equipment to explore different types of input, different frequencies or um, intensities of the movement, and then we give suggestions for home because we know that not everyone has a swing, not everyone has a barrel, but it's a tool for us to get to know these kids better. So our next sense is the tactile sense or our sense of touch. There's some a little bit of anatomy stuff on here, but I'll kind of break that down. So we have two portions of our tactile system. 
The first one is an older, more primitive system, and that's responsible for your fight or flight response. It also processes things like pain, temperature, um, crude and light touch, and even itch. And then the second one listed there is newer, and it's more discriminative. It processes higher level responses. Um, one of them is being able to recognize the form of an object by, just by touching it um, and not seeing it. So an example of that would be if you reached into your purse and you were feeling for your lipstick. You could feel that lipstick and recognize it without actually having to look at it. So it's a little bit more discriminative and higher level. Um, that part of your tactile system, too, also helps perceive vibration and deep pressure touch. And what's interesting about these two systems, because you can see that they're a little bit opposite, um, that higher level, more discriminative system actually helps inhibit the more primitive one. So that higher level, newer system will help inhibit that fight or flight response and help you organize input. So you'll see where that kind of comes into play with some of the red flags. Okay, so some red flags for tactile. Kids who are over-responsive have what we OTs like to call it tactile defensiveness. So you'll see intolerance of touch, anxiety with touch. They're going to respond negatively with any kind of unexpected um, touch or become aggressive. So I'll see this happen a lot in preschools where you know, a child is on the verge of getting kicked out because when they're, you know, in circle time or they're in line, if someone lightly bumps into them, that fight or flight response kicks in and maybe they're going to hit or maybe they're going to bite because their system is overly responsive to that. These kids also um, can be resistant to different self-care activities. So I have kids come in that don't like to wear certain types of clothing um, or certain um, fabrics of clothing, um, even like tags in their shirt, for example. These kids can also be picky eaters, so they limit their textures. Um, I've had kids that come in who are toe walking that fall under this category. Um, those are just some quick examples. Kids who are under under-responsive have a poor registration of touch, so they're only going to notice really intense touch. Um, they have decreased awareness of hot, so that can be a safety issue. Also decreased awareness and response to pain, so they end up having a really high pain tolerance. So these are kids that they fall and get hurt, and you think, ooh, that's got to that's gotta really hurt, and they're just fine, and they get up and keep going. Um, our sensory seekers want more and more and more touch, and they're going to try to satisfy that need by crashing into things, seeking hugs. They may be too rough in their play. So this sounds a lot like our proprioceptive slide, but you can see that all these senses tie together. These kids that don't have that good tactile awareness are going to seek out that input into their muscles and joints to self-regulate. Um, these kids are great with messy play, whereas those who are over-responsive do not like to get their hands messy. They're not going to do those crafts in school. Um, but overall, our sensory seekers need more of that deep pressure, need more skin contact than most. Um, now, kids can be a sensory combination in this area where they accept certain types of touch or tactile experiences, but not others. Um, and some have what we would call tactile discrimination disorder. So that includes having difficulty paying attention to physical attributes of objects or using their sense of touch for more complex purposes. So they seem kind of out of touch with their own hands to learn new things like cutting, drawing, writing, and it can have a developmental impact. Next, I have some different pictures. Of a few tactile-based activities, again, there are many more out there. The first one on the far left, there is a boy that we're doing pillow squishes with. So laying down and making our kid into a sandwich, doing some deep pressure by pushing the pillows um, gently but firmly on his back. Um, the middle, um, giving hugs for deep pressure input to satisfy that tactile sense. And then on the far right, we have a kid using 
the brushing program. That's a specific program that OTs will try with kids who especially have that tactile defensiveness to clothing. Um, so some of you might be familiar with that if the OT's been using that with your child. Um, if you're interested in it, I highly recommend that you seek out an OT to trial it with your child and train you in doing it. Okay, and then the next slide is actually more, I would say, vestibular activities. So this is one thing that we have used in outpatient. It's very popular though, so you might get a hole in it. <laughs> it's called the whale and it's a giant inflatable cushion. The kids can climb on it. They can, you can do gentle movement on it. Um, so that is a really fun movement activity. All right, next we're gonna cover vision. So when we think of vision, we're thinking a lot about our clarity of vision, whether it's 2020. But when we're thinking about sensory processing, it's a little bit different. Um, know that your visual system is more complex than that. We identify sights, but it also helps us anticipate what's coming at us in order to prepare for a response. Um, vision, um, unlike just pure sight, is not a skill we're born with. It's one that develops as we integrate our different senses, um, and it helps us make sense of what we see. It also perceives some qualities like form, pattern, and figure ground. So figure ground is if, an example would be if you have your child get a specific toy out of their toy bin that's full of different stuff. They can find that specific toy amongst all the clutter. Vision will influence developmental skills. So think of eye-hand coordination, things like coloring, cutting, tool use. And also know that the visual system has a connection with the vestibular or the movement system, and that's going to give us spatial perception. So you guys can kind of see how everything's tied in together. If you have a deficit in one area, it's probably going to impact another. So some red flags with vision. Um, just know that children having difficulties in this area, especially if they're over-responsive, may prefer to be in the dark. They might not like bright lights. Um, a lot of kids that I work with on the autism spectrum have a reaction to those really bright, harsh fluorescent lights that you have in classrooms. Um, so sometimes by being in a room with just dim lighting, you can see a difference in their demeanor and their ability to focus. Um, kids that are over-responsive will react dramatically to things like contrast, reflections, really bright lights. Um, they also have difficulty responding to moving objects visually. So um, these kids might have difficulty in gym class playing catch or playing kickball because they don't quite know how to respond. Kids that are under-responsive um, have poor attention to visual stimuli, on the other hand, so they're not noticing those things that the over-responsive kids are noticing. Um, example of that, you know, they go into their classroom, they go into their home, and the furniture is rearranged or there's holiday decorations and they're not registering that. Um, kids who are sensory seekers are craving that visual input, um, that excessive time in front of the TV or computer screen. They might be more attracted to flashing lights and things that are bright. Um, I had a boy in my caseload years ago. He was a sensory seeker when it came to the visual aspect and what I noticed with him was he loved playing with Thomas the Train, um, but he had a visual stim that really impacted his ability to play functionally. So what he would do, see if I can describe it good, because I usually show it to people, is that he put the train on the very edge of the table, he kind of moved his head to the side, squinted out of the corner of his eye, and just moved the train back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, repetitively in front of his eyes. And that's what he did with the trains. So that was an example of a visual stim or visual seeking. Um, another girl I evaluated a few years ago, her parents said she loved puzzles but didn't know how to play with them. So you would think maybe just purely a developmental issue, but it was in part a sensory issue because as soon as I got the puzzle out, she went right for it, but she took two puzzle pieces and also two shook them back and forth in front of her eyes. And again, she really didn't participate functionally in that activity. 
Um, some other things to note about vision, these kids can have poor visual discrimination, so they're not linking that visual info with other senses, like their sense of touch, hearing, and movement, um, and they can have those poor visual motor skills. So they have trouble using their vision to guide movements. So they're going to have difficulty um, with forming letters and shapes and doing all those tabletop type tasks. Okay. So we'll move on to the auditory sense. And when it comes to sensory processing, it's not necessarily your quality of hearing, but it's your ability to discriminate and filter sounds. And that obviously will impact attention, focus, and their awareness of their environment. Kids who are over-responsive have what we call auditory defensiveness. So we talked about fight or flight before. Um, these kids will have that fight or flight or even that freeze response to sound. Um, they might startle easily to sound. I have kids that get very easily distracted by sound. So sometimes, you know, I'll be working with them in a private treatment room in our center, door shut, it's completely quiet or so I think, and they go, what's that sound? And I have to listen really carefully. And it's the clock ticking on the wall that distracts them. So you can imagine how that would impact them in other environments. Um, I see other kids that have a really negative response to loud and unexpected sounds. And a lot of kids do, but think more extreme where, you know, they might flee where they're at or they might have a meltdown that instead of lasting for a few minutes might last for a few hours. Um, I've also had kids that I've worked with that have trouble tolerating lower frequency sounds, so that would include vacuum, um, toilet flushing. I worked with one boy that had trouble tolerating the sound of water coming out of the faucet, um, so their responses might vary. They might hold their hands over their ears, cry, have that meltdown, have that flight response where they want to leave wherever they're at. Kids who are under-responsive, on the other hand, seem unaware of sounds others hear or listen to. Um, so they don't seem to process when you call their name. You have to say it maybe a few times, and you think they are ignoring you, but they might actually, they might not be. Um, so often the way to get their attention is not only just saying their name a few times, but pairing saying their name with putting your hand on their shoulder with that sense of touch. Kids who are sensory seekers, on the other hand, love crowded places with noisy action. Um, they may make a lot of their own noisy sounds or use a louder voice. And I have a situation happen where I have a kid that is really um, has a lot of issues with unexpected sounds and those loud sounds like I mentioned, but the parents will say, but they're making loud sounds all the time. I don't get it. And my theory with that is these kids like to have control of the sound in their environment. So they're going to make those loud sounds maybe in anticipation of the loud sounds that are coming. And they can control those sounds they're making. They can't control a fire engine going by, for example. Also in this area, kids could have poor auditory discrimination. So they have difficulty detecting likenesses and differences in words, and also picking out teacher's voice from background noise. So that can impact their focus. Okay, taste and smell is next, and that's the body's ability to discriminate taste and smells in the surrounding environment. Kids who are over-responsive avoid or seek out certain tastes or smells. Um, kids who are under-responsive, an example of that would be not really noticing strong odors or maybe strong tastes. And then sensory seekers in this area are routinely smelling non-food items. Okay, so those are the different senses. I'm going to talk a little bit about motor planning, and it's not a sensory system in and of itself, but it's a result of efficient sensory processing. It's usually an unconscious process that helps us come up with an idea for a movement, plan it, organize it, and carry it out. Um, so think about someone throwing a baseball back and forth with a friend. You innately have that ability to figure out 
and maybe it might take a few tries, but you can figure out where to position my arm, how to hold the ball, um, how far to bring my arm back, how hard to throw it, where to aim. And really, over time, you don't even have to think about that. But a child that has poor motor planning has trouble following all those tiny little steps in order to do that task. Um, so they'll have difficulty learning new skills, not just gross motor, but fine motor and tabletop activities, poor oral motor for feeding or speech sounds. Um, so some terms you'll hear out there, there's dyspraxia, which is difficulty in conceptualizing motor planning and sequencing out unfamiliar actions in a skillful way, um, or apraxia, which more so has to do with the speech aspect. Um, but as you can see, if kids have some sort of deficit in some of those different sensory systems, it'll impact their motor planning, it'll impact their body awareness to do these different activities. So the next slide covers the process of sensory integration. We'll cover a little bit about how it affects development and learning. So our body and brain has to be able to detect and perceive information from the environment, interpret the meaning, and make appropriate adaptations in their behavior as a response. Um, so example that I've given, I remember from school, um, I was in a classroom once and um, the backyard of the school was there and you know the maintenance men are mowing the lawn, it's near summertime, the windows are open. So I hear the lawnmower going and I can see the maintenance men out there mowing the lawn. So that's our change in environment on that top right there. Um, and that novel sensory input is generated, the sound, the sight. My brain registers that information and then I'll orient to it, so I'll, I'll turn to it but then I'm able to tune out that sound and visually focus on what I need to do. But you can see if a kid is a sensory seeker or if they're easily distracted, how they might be thrown off in that situation and they're not following that progression. Okay, so kids with sensory difficulties can obviously show a wide variety of behaviors and those can lead to learning difficulties. You'll hear the terms sensory integration dysfunction and sensory processing disorder and just think of that as an umbrella term. Um, some kids are gonna show more severe sensory issues, some will be moderate and some will be very minimal. That can be a diagnosis in and of itself but often it's paired with um, other diagnoses that have sensory challenges. So think autism, ADHD, kids with learning disabilities, different genetic syndromes, et cetera. Okay. So I'm gonna try to fly through some of these next few slides. That way I can get to evaluation and treatment. And I have some videos for you guys. So as I was going through the different red flags, you can see how these kids' development can be impacted. So one area can be social. They might be aware that they're different from their typically developing peers. And oftentimes, they're not well understood by others, whether it be a friend or an adult. So that kid that really has trouble sitting still in class and is getting up, or maybe they don't have that good impulse control to stay quiet when they should be, they might be viewed negatively by their teacher that they're trying to cause trouble or they're not listening, but the child might be well-intentioned. Um, so they might continue that behavior for attention, they might withdraw as a result, or maybe they're becoming you know, more defensive and it's impacting their self-esteem. Emotionally, they might have difficulty discovering who they are. Um, that social piece can be impacted, so they might have issues receiving and perceiving feedback from others, knowing what to do with it, creating positive relationships, and having that healthy self-worth. Physically, we talked about earlier how some kids don't like that strong movement input or weight bearing. They might avoid certain motor activities, whereas show a strong preference for certain ones. And that really could isolate their skills and they may have poor gross and fine motor skills. So that can include balance, sequencing their movements, so think about that motor planning, and bilateral coordination, so using two hands together for an activity. Um, so that could be gross motor or even 
fine motor, holding down their paper while writing a sentence. Functionally, there's an impact both in the classroom and at home, following directions, reading environmental cues, having trouble making sense of their world visually. Um, we already talked about motor skills. They can have aversions to noisy environments. Uh, we'll see kids with food acceptances or refusals. Um, behavioral concerns can result. Social skills are impacted. And also, too, some of these kids will have a hard time self-calming when they get upset or overloaded and may have difficulty sleeping as well. Okay. So sensory processing can impact learning. As you guys can see, I'm not going to go too in depth on this because I really do want you guys to see those videos. Um, but there's also a behavioral component. People will often ask me, you know, what my child's doing. Is it because of the sensor issues or is it just more behavioral? And really, it can be hard to separate that. We have to consider both. Um, sometimes what starts out as a sensory need um, or a way to sensory avoid becomes a behavior because the child gets attention for it. Um, but we still have to address both those issues together. We have to find a way to manage those behavioral challenges and help the child learn and grow in that aspect, but also support their sensory needs so they're successful. As an OT, I'm trained in some different behavioral techniques. You know, I use behavior management within my sessions naturally, but some of these kids might need more behavioral support, um, and I'll recommend those services for them if I think they should need it. Okay, I'm going to just move forward here for a moment. I'm going to talk about what we do in therapy. So in therapy, these kids were using a sensory integrative approach. So that's to help expose their body to more organized sensory experiences, and that will help them make better adaptations you know, with their environment and whatever tasks that they might have. And with each kid, it's going to vary. Um, during the evaluation, there's multiple things that I like to do. I ask a lot of questions. Each kid is different, so I want to talk to the parent or whoever's working with the child, and maybe if the child's old enough and cognitively aware, I'm going to ask them questions too, you know, to give me more information to get to know them better and what their needs are. I'll do some clinical observations depending on, you know, what kid I'm working with. I had one evaluation where I was in the sensory room, I was talking to mom, but I set up the room with different things. You know, therapy at the table, I had a trampoline out with some pillows, and what was interesting to me was this girl, um, instead of jumping on the trampoline and jumping into the pillows like I thought she would, she actually went underneath the trampoline and wedged herself in there, and that told me, wow, she likes those tight spaces, she likes that deep pressure input. Um, so I'm always watching to see kind of what their reactions are to things. You know, I might have them sitting at the table playing with that putty and finding little items inside, and I'll have the parents say, wow, they must really like that. I've never seen them sit still for so long. So I can get, you know, some of those clinical observations in outpatient, which, you know, is an, a less natural environment. Um, I'll give the parents or the caregiver a sensory questionnaire, sensory profiles listed on your slide. There's another one I like to use called a sensory processing measure. Um, it has a set of questions related to each of those senses. Um, and when I score that, it kind of gives me an idea of where to guide my treatment, where the child's needs are. But I take it with a grain of salt, too, because not everyone is a great reporter, or you might not be aware of some of those situations. You haven't been looking for it. So that can impact the results a little bit. So I have to use my clinical expertise to really be a detective and figure out what that child needs. All right, so what do we do in therapy? Generally speaking with treatment, we're going to start off with those sensory activities. So activities that are going to provide whatever sensory input that child needs in order for them to be regulated, for them to be successful with whatever tasks they're having challenges with. Um, especially those kids that are sensory seekers or maybe they have a lower arousal level, they need more sensory input to be alert it's great to do some of those activities first before plopping them at the table. If they're not regulated, if their bodies don't feel calm, we're not going to be successful doing things like writing, cutting, and drawing. Even when doing those tabletop tasks, I try to make them multi-sensory. So not just using pencil and paper, but 
using chalk, writing and shaving cream, um, making adaptations at the table for movement, maybe sitting on a ball chair. Um, I'm trying those different things with each kid because they're all so different in order for me to give that home program. So I want these kids to be successful when they're outside of therapy because that's such a short amount of time during their week. I want families to feel comfortable that they have the tools to manage their child's sensory needs and they see improvement. So I'm going to show you a video. It's of a three-year-old girl with delayed milestones receiving therapy for a month, um, and she's engaging, she's engaging in tactile messy play with her shoes off to receive input um, in order to help with some of that tactile ins insensitivity. Um, previously, she had extreme negative reactions to feet and gross and messy play. Sorry, and grass and messy play. And I just need you guys to give me one second because we're trying to get the video to come up. Thank you for holding on. Can you guys see a video? Yeah, Melissa, if you guys, let me know if you can see the video. All right, Melissa, it's, the video is showing, but it was very, very choppy. It was like going by frame by frame. Okay. I have my tech person here helping me because <laughs> I'm not good at that stuff. All right, well, let's see if we can get another one to work. All right. I'm going to click on it first to see if I can get it to work or not. If you click on the top, oh, you click on the top where it says share. Okay. Then you can share your screen and navigate off the webinar software. You can share the screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. So just share desktop and share? Yep. And then you can click on another end. Okay. Um, all right, one second. <laughs> yeah, but everyone can see everyone as well. We're trying. So we are now seeing the folder with all of the videos and it's still trying to Okay, run. yeah, we just clicked on one. Okay, it's coming. Is it working for you guys? I can see it. You can see it? Okay. All right, great. I'm just going to pause it for a moment. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so um, in this set of videos, I have a child at the time, he's four, diagnosed with um, PDD, so he's on the autism spectrum. He's participating in OT to improve his sensory regulation, but we're also working on developmental um, areas impacted, like his fine motor skills, his cutting skills. Um, I'm doing a sensory activity with him before transitioning to the table um, in order to improve his attention and also decrease some of the sensory seeking behaviors. So he was a kid that was frequently spinning and crashing, uh, chewing on his shirt collar, chewing on toys. Um, I mentioned before that sensory integration is child-led, so um, part of that is giving them those guided experiences but using their interests, so he really loves animals, so I'm using animals as part of his activity. So he was on the scooter board, and he um, has to work on pulling himself just using his hands along to get an animal that he likes. So that's incorporating some of that movement, but also proprioception. He has to um, pull his whole body weight, so he's getting a lot of input into his muscles and joints. Um, it's also going to address motor planning, too, and that body positioning. So you can see him. Um, 
and I think I had told him to go very go slowly because he had been going too fast, <laughs> and it was getting a little erratic, and he took me very literally. So you can see him. He's trying to adjust his movement. Um, I think this is actually the second set of the videos with him, but the first set, um, he has difficulty figuring out you know, his pace of movement, he would go off track but couldn't get himself back on track enough to be successful. Um, but you can see here, he's, he's trying to figure it out. He's taking his time more. Um, and for him, motor planning wise, it required a few repeti repetitions of doing the activity to really get the hang of it and improve his movement. All right, so it's... Um, it's 12.48. Did you want me to start taking questions? There were some more videos, but I don't want to um, limit any time that we have. Well, I can unmute so everyone's line. Okay. The conference has been unmuted. There we go. So does anyone have to One second. I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble hearing. One moment. Nope, they're on the table right there. Yep, there you go. Oh, they are. 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 Oh, one person asked, would a child with dyspraxia generally avoid new activities such as riding a bike? And the answer, I would definitely say yes. Um, these kids might um, avoid those kind of movement activities because they're more challenging for them. They might not know how to approach it. They might also lack some of you know, that body awareness and their postural control, so they're really to balance. So riding a bike could be very daunting. Okay. All right, and then I see another question here. The conference um, has been muted. Yeah. I, hello, Melissa. Oh, wait. Hold on, Melissa. Um. Partially, you're going to be working on some of those coping skills with that child, um, working on being in those environments in small doses. Um, something that we've tried, um, that I'm trained in an outpatient, is the therapeutic listening program, which is a special. I'm trying to find where it was now. I don't even know. <laughs> but the question was a boy that had trouble tolerating loud sounds, especially girls in the classroom. Um, there's a variety of things that we can do. I mentioned working on some of those coping skills and coping strategies to, you know, more effectively manage, you know, handling those louder sounds. Um, depending where the child is at cognitively, I've used uh, social or situational stories with them. Um, and then an outpatient, I'm trained in the therapeutic listening program, which is um, modulated, specially modulated or designed music that you can gear towards the child's sensory needs. So if they have sensory sensitivities, um, this music can actually um, help with regulating that part of their system. Um, but again, that's a specialized program. Uh, there's cost with that, so I try to work on some of the other strategies that I previously mentioned. But each kid is different, too. Um, let's see what else I have here. OK. What kind of auditory, defensive, and visual stimming activities would you use to replace in the clinic? Um, so some of the visual aspect, we're working on different um, sensory activities to satisfy that need. So instead of stimming off of that um, puzzle piece or that toy, we're going to incorporate other types of sensory input into their session to help self-regulate them. So we know that the visual system is tied to the vestibular. So doing different types of movement activities with them, uh, whether it be rolling or back and forth on the swing, um, 
also teaching them how to functionally play with those toys, so shaping that behaviorally as well. The kids that are auditory defensive, I mentioned some strategies for that, but um, you know, I'm not trying to shelter them into a quiet environment the whole time. We're going to be working on being in that you know, maybe busy gym um, and finding uh, you know, different tools to use for that. If they're getting distracted, um, what are some strategies we can use to redirect to that? Again, I'm not going super specific just because I, ethically I don't want to um, give too specific of information for kids that I haven't seen. Um, if a parent would like to have their child evaluated specifically for apraxia, can TheraPlay assess this? So as um, OTs, PTs, speech therapists, we cannot give a diagnosis to a child that's not within our scope of practice. We can assess the different areas that that poor motor planning is impacting and address that and also give you guys any kind of guidance as to um, a clinician that could assess it um, in order to help that child further. What type of sensory strategies would you try for a child that is picking out a skin and holes? Um, so with that, that sounds like partially that could be a, a tactile type needs that we're trying to satisfy with that kid. Um, I might trial the brushing program with them. Again, it's something directed by an OT that we can train the caregiver in. Um, I would also try activities that provide some of that deep pressure input, the pillow squishes, the hugs, some of the weight-bearing activities to incorporate throughout the day to see if that reduces some of the picking. Um, could try lotion massage. Um, I would also want to know more, too, what's the root cause of that picking? Is it anxiety-related? Is it linked to something specifically? Um, so that's something I would want to uncover. Another question, can sensory processing disorder be associated with or mistaken for a low IQ? Um, I think that depending on how the child presents, that maybe that could happen, um, especially kids that might appear to be you know, lower functioning, they might have limited verbal skills or really poor engagement where it doesn't seem like they're really connected with their world. So to someone else, maybe it does look like they have an IQ, but they could actually be, you know, um, have higher cognitive skills than what it appears to be because they seem a little bit more disconnected. All right, do we have any other questions? It doesn't look like it. Um, hopefully my presentation was helpful for you guys just to give you some background information. Um, and hopefully I could answer most of your questions. Uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in today. Um, and that is all. Thank you very much. Okay, Melissa, thank you very much for your time. This recording will be pieced back together and posted both okay. on the Parent Information Center website and the link sent to all of the participants and registrants via email within the next day or two. Um, also, I will be sending it on to you, Melissa, and your okay. staff there at TheraPlay. Great. I want to thank you very much for your time. And everyone, you know, you can always contact the Parent Information Center or TheraPlay directly if other questions come up after this, you know, viewing this webinar, thinking about it for a while. We are here to help. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.